So maybe cosine inverse is even. So let's look at that and say and think about why that either is the case or is not the case. So is cos inverse even? So I don't know, so I'll put a question mark above the equal sign. So is cos inverse of negative x equal to cos inverse of regular x? That's what it means to be even. So this doesn't make any sense because of the domain of cos inverse. What is the domain of cosine inverse? The range of cos, which was somewhere, I think it was one of the first things we did. Uh oh. Okay, so here we go. Domain is right here, and here's the range. So. The domain is negative 1 to 1, so it's okay to input negative values. So it makes sense to write cos of negative x. Let's think about the range. Range has to be positive. Can't be negative output. I have in my notes, there's no such identity for cos inverse, but the reason I have in my notes is not true. In my notes, I have domain cosine is everything that's greater than or equal to zero. Well, zero to pi, but that's the range. So we're allowed to input negatives. Now I'm concerned that my notes are wrong. Does anybody have their textbook? What do they say about cos inverse being even in there? It should be near the beginning of 7.6. And while we're looking that up, let's try to do something really similar to what we did for sine inverse to show that that was odd. So we'll try something similar and see if that'll work out. So I'm going to go off the one that actually worked. So we'll start out, let cos inverse negative x equal y. And flip this around. So negative x equals regular cos y. And now the even property of cosine lets me replace y by negative y. So cos y is equal to cos negative y. Now we'll bring cosine back. Oops, before we do that. So we had negative, so I'm looking over here, we had negative x, and then we multiply both sides by negative 1. So we'll do that same move here. Multiply both sides by negative 1. Now we have a problem because this negative sign, the one we just wrote down, what we did before is we pushed it inside the sine function. But I can't do that with cosine. Cosine is not odd, so I can't push that negative inside. So we're stuck right here. Is that the right through? All right, can't push a negative through even functions. So that was property of odd functions only. So what I can't do is take cos inverse until I get rid of that negative sign right there. So we're stuck right here. Did your book say anything about cos 
inverse not being odd or not being even. All right, so I'm going to write no because it's in my notes, but the wrong reasons in my notes. <coughs> We're going to keep going with more identities. And these are the geometric ones now. So we'll cross all that stuff out. It's not wrong. It's just not useful. <coughs> so these are going to be geometric identities. And we'll draw a circle here. I wish I could draw a circle like that too. It makes all my other writing look bad. You can tell they don't. The ink to shape only works, I think, for closed figures, and it doesn't work for a line. Maybe if I made this, nope. Yeah, it doesn't like the shape I want to draw. It also doesn't work for axes like that. All right, we are. Just going to look at the top half of this unit circle. Oh, I can keep drawing this down. And I'll write on it in blue. And don't want to assume that's 45 degrees. So we're going to do something a little bit strange. I haven't done anything strange with the unit circle yet. Call that value x. Um, it's a unit circle. Normally, we would measure this angle as theta right here. But <coughs> instead of taking our independent or our input to be theta, I'm going to take the input to be x. If the input is x, how can I figure out what angle? I will write theta here temporarily, but I'm going to erase it. We better take off ink to shape. I want to figure out how do I write theta as some function of x? How are theta and x related? What trig function relates theta and x? Cosine. Cosine. So cos theta equals x. So I want to figure out what is theta. So theta equals cos inverse x. So that is what I want to write for the angle right here. So I'm going to take x to be the input, and our angle is cos inverse, theta, uh, cos inverse x. So that angle is cos inverse x. Now I'm going to measure this angle in a weird way. We don't normally measure from the y-axis. <coughs> so that is going to be sine inverse x. Why in the world is that sine inverse x? Let's redraw our circle. Redraw, redraw our triangle. That side is x. The angle I want to measure is right there. So I just redrew that angle uh, inside of our triangle. And that angle theta is the same as the other angle theta that I drew there. And this is something like alternating angles, some geometry theory. It's because your two, your two sides here are parallel. So you're but opposite angles are going to be the same. All right. In th so any questions about those two angles being the same? In this triangle, how do I relate x and theta? Forget about this other theta. But the one inside the triangle, how do I relate x and theta together? Sorry. In this case, we're going to go sine, because we've got opposite now. 
So theta equals sine inverse x. And those theta, as we said, are the same. So we got our sine inverse x in our triangle. So right away, we get one identity. What do I get if I add up these two angles? 90 degrees, or pi over 2. So add together those two, you get pi over 2. So there's our first identity. And we're going to label some more stuff inside the circle. That was x, then that one is negative x, right there. So positive x, negative x. And the point on the circle, and do the same thing we did before. I'm gonna move this cos inverse x, oh no. going to just give myself more space here. The new angle I just drew there that gets into the second quadrant, if you know that this is negative x over here, what is the angle I just drew? Probably could do that. Yes, it looks like that that would be one name for it. But if I don't want to add anything and just have an inverse trig function of x. Would you use tangent? Cos nope. inverse of negative x. Cos inverse negative x, because our x value is just negative x, and then we're doing the exact same thing we did the first time. We just look at cos inverse of that. It's way too big of a pender right there. I'll make some room. So that's cos inverse negative x right there. And this last angle I wrote here, there's a few ways to describe it. One way would be, let's see, pi minus cos inverse x will be one way to write it. Why is it also true that it's just cosine inverse x? I measured the angle in a weird way. I didn't start over at the positive x-axis. Those two angles are the same. So that'll be just cos inverse x. So only geometrically, because those two angles are the same. All right, now let's relate these together in a few ways. So looking here, what is cos? I'll try to write all the identities in one spot and fit everything on the screen. What do I get if I take cos inverse x plus cos inverse negative x? So add the green angle and this blue angle together. What do you get? You get pi. And the version that we're going to use is solve for cos inverse negative x. And we get pi minus cos inverse x.
these are the main identities we're going to use, the main geometric identities. get into tangent and cotangent. So we went with this angle right here plus there's probably another identity I can pull out of here but that was just the one that I, I went with. Can we find it real quick? Maybe. We can spend two minutes and see if we can. Somebody in here is clever enough to get another identity that's useful out. Between the y axis and the line, is that negative sine x? Negative. This sine. right here? Yeah. Is that the same as the sine? Let me write in green on top. Uh, arc sine x. This is sine inverse x. The. Uh, and I know that just geometrically because it's the same angle as the one over on the right side. I could redraw the triangle. There's probably some more identities, and you're welcome to experiment and see if there's any more useful ones that come out. These are the ones that we're going to use, though. The ones that will be useful for us in this class. How would we go about <coughs> experimenting with that to find more? It's probably not a good way to spend your time. Okay. Uh, seeing if there's different names, if you can give these angles different names, and then if two of them add up to either pi or pi over 2, basically. Okay. Or subtract to pi or pi over 2. Okay. Um, I drew all these angles going the positive direction, so I didn't really bother labeling the fact that they were all uh, counterclockwise rotations. Okay. So we'll go s tangent and cotangent now. Start out when y equals tan inverse x. This is the same as tan y equals x. We had to restrict the domain of tangent down, which was negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. And that is the, let's see, range of tangent inverse. And domain of tangent inverse is all real numbers. And for cotangent, cotangent inverse. I don't think we actually looked at cotangent inverse way back in trig class, so let's go ahead and look at cotangent inverse now. Where does cotangent inverse come from? It comes from cotangent and then you invert it. So I'm going to draw a cotangent graph. So our x-intercepts become vertical asymptotes. So our x-intercepts of tangent were 0. Next one was pi. And if we go negative, we get negative pi. And this was a decreasing function that was 0 in between.
So this function is very not one-to-one, -one, just like tangent. So we have a choice. And of course, there's infinite more periods that go both sides. So I don't need to draw any more. It's already obviously not one-to-one. -one. So which of these two should we take? The one that goes 0 to pi or the one that goes negative to pi to 0? 0 to pi. 0 to pi. Keep it positive so you can choose. So let's erase all this stuff here. Get rid of all this negative stuff. Oh, too much. And we'll write the uh, domain and range of cotangent. And then swap them and that'll be the domain and range of the inverse. All right, domain cotangent, 0 to pi, and range, what is the range of cotangent? Okay. Negative yep, everything, negative infinity, positive infinity, go all the way up and down over y values. All right, domain of the cotangent is the range of the inverse. So domain cotangent equals range Cotangent inverse. Range of regular cotangent is the domain of cotangent inverse. How do you actually, so we made the graph one to one, or made the function one to one. How do we invert on a graph? Switch the xy axis. And one way to accomplish that is reflect across the line y equals x. So if we went to graph the inverse function, the y equals x line, something like that, and maybe not have the slope perfect because I did, wasn't careful. According to my measurements, that's pi right there. And I wasn't really careful about my vertical. I, don't, I can't tell you exactly where pi is on the y-axis because I wasn't careful picking out values. So we'll just approximate y equals x right there, and when I make that swap, here's x-axis, y-axis, when I swap these two axes, we'll graph tangent inverse. So our x equals pi asymptote becomes y equals pi x and y are swapping. So anything that was x equals is now y equals. And the x equals 0 becomes y equals 0. So there's our asymptotes. And our point, which was pi over 2 is 0, is now swap that around 0, pi over 2. So that is 0, pi over 2. And now, if you're a visual person who can use their visual skills and draw well, you can reflect this curve. If you're not a visual person who can flip, reflect this around, I'm having a little trouble. So I'm going to think about this part of the curve doesn't change that much when I reflect it. Where in the world does that part of the curve land? I think it lands right around here, like that. So the graph is going to look like this. All right, so there's a graph in our first line, y equals cotangent inverse x, the same as cotangent y equals x. And we have our, let's see, domain, oops, x. So looking over here, cotangent inverse. We gotta restrict x 
and or Y. All right, so the range of cotangents everything. So this range is everything that doesn't put a restriction on X. But we are restricted on our Y. So our Y needs to live inside of the domain of cotangent, which is 0 to pi. You could write, um, let's see, so up here I didn't write x in, but I could write x's in the interval in the infinity, positive infinity, but that's a little bit redundant. We didn't assume it was going to be anything other than a real number. So don't really need to write down where x comes from when it's all real numbers. All right, so there's cotangent inverse. And what about secant and cosecant? We'll look at the properties. This is not an exhaustive list of properties. These are just the properties that we need for what we're going to do. This is not a redo of everything from pre-calculus 2. So we're going to do a secant. Given secant inverse x equals y, we will flip this around, so move the secant inverse function on the other side as a regular secant. Uh-oh. One, that should be a y on the right side. Secant y. Secant y is one over cos y. And now I'm going to reciprocate both sides. So to take both sides and I get first power. If you don't like reciprocating both sides, all we're doing is basically multiplying by denominators and then dividing by numerators. So we can accomplish the same thing by multiplying by 1 over x, 1 over cos y. We didn't have any numerators really, so I didn't have to divide by those. So you perform these two operations. On the left side, you get 1 over cos y on the right side, cos y, uh oh, cos, cos y to the top. yeah it sure does, so I'm going to multiply by number one, there we go, so the right side, the cos y cancels cos y, we get one over x right there, so you can uh, accomplish the same thing with multiplication, but it's a little faster, it's less writing to just reciprocate your equation. And what the heck? Oh, geez. Wow. There we go. That's reciprocating both sides. 1 over x and 1 over cos becomes regular cos. All right. Now we'll take cos inverse. Yeah. At the beginning, we started out with y equaling sequent, secant inverse x. So just connect the first and the last together. Cos inverse 1 over x equals sec inverse x. So there's another identity. So if we go back and use the what we just wrote down before, so we have cos inverse x plus cos.
cos inverse negative x equals pi. use that one we'll use this one all right so cos inverse x equals pi over 2 minus sine inverse x and I'm going to use identity on the left side pi over 2 minus sine inverse 1 over x equals secant inverse x, and that, that's the identity I wanted. So one thing you should be noticing is these identities are probably not easy to memorize. Good thing for your cheat sheet to have on it, because they're very easy to mess up. A, is, should this be a pi or a pi over 2? Should it be a plus or a minus? So very similar problems memorizing these is all the tricky ones in trig class. So these should go, I don't give you your cheat sheet, you write your own cheat sheet, so these should definitely go on there. Unless somehow you can memorize these, I certainly can't. All right, so that's cos inverse. We'll do the same, uh, the same thing for cosecant, and we'll get some very similar identities out of that. So we started here with secant. We're gonna do some very similar operations to cosecant. So step one, we'll flip this around. X equals cosecant y. Cosecant y is one over sine y. Reciprocate both sides. And take sine inverse. And then unsubstitute for y. same trick we did at the end using cos inverse plus sine inverse equals pi over 2 and we'll solve for sine inverse will be pi over 2 minus cos inverse and now applying this so sine inverse I'm going to replace that by pi over 2 minus cos inverse 1 over x equals cosecant inverse x. So I know these are a little bit tricky. You were doing quite a bit at one time, including doing a lot of substituting very quickly. So I, I could rewrite this identity here as sine inverse of a box equals pi over 2 minus cos inverse of a box. And whatever I put in the box will work out. They just have to be the same. Yeah, the only thing that wouldn't work out is if it, wasn't, it made sine inverse not defined. Okay. So there's, sine inverse doesn't have the biggest domain. So I can't put anything in the box, but anything in the box that makes sense to put in there. So like sine inverse is a domain of negative 1 to 1. So anything in there will work. And obviously, you know, x is 0 won't, will make it undefined. So there's some very clear values that won't work. 
All right, we're going to find the inverse trig derivatives now. So we did a few of these already. And what we're going to do is compute these the fast way. So I'm going to let f of x equals sine x, f prime of x, the derivative is cosine x, and f inverse of x would then be sine inverse x. So I'm choosing regular f to be sine, and I just took a derivative and wrote the inverse. <coughs> and this is the inverse derivative that we wrote down in, I think, 7, 1, we did the inverse derivative, which is 1 over f prime of f inverse. And the reason I wrote all those down, so I can just sub them right in, f prime of x is cosine of f inverse, which is sine inverse x. And now we need to simplify the inside part. So we're going to let theta equal sine inverse x. means sine theta equals x and I'll divide by 1 so we have theta sine is opposite over hypotenuse and Pythagorean theorem this is 1 squared minus x squared square root so this is all just some trig review and I think we did this exact problem earlier which is why I'm going through it really quickly right now and what is this is 1 over cos. We just replaced sine inverse by theta, so this is 1 over cos theta. And that is hypotenuse over adjacent. It's the reciprocal of cosine, so hypotenuse is 1, adjacent is square root 1 minus x squared. So that is the derivative of sine inverse x. So I told you for homework two weeks ago or so to do the other, maybe one week, to do the derivative of cos inverse, derivative of tan inverse. And then I gave you cosecant inverse derivative on your quiz, which, because you did it at home, could check your answer very easily by using Wolfram, Symbol Lab, some other fancy thing that I don't know about. All right, so there's sine inverse derivative. So we're going to go to <laughs> cos inverse derivative next. So we absolutely can go through a very similar process and get cos inverse derivative. There is another way to do it, though. So we wrote down some identities. We didn't just do that because they were interesting. So let's see if we can rewrite cos inverse in terms of sine inverse. The answer is we can, but let's do it carefully. Somewhere up here. Here we go. No. Yeah, so we have this one right here. So I'm going to rewrite the one that's right in the middle of the screen there. So we'll just rewrite that one. So I want to rewrite cos inverse in terms of sine inverse. So I can make my derivative uh, go by really quickly. So sine inverse plus cos is pi over 2. So we'll solve for cos inverse x, pi over 2 minus sine inverse x. So our derivative, we could just take a derivative of pi over 2 
minus sine inverse x. Easy question, what's the derivative of pi over 2? Zero. It's got a letter in it, but it's constant. So pi through pi is or pi over two is zero. What's the derivative of sine inverse x? Yeah, well we just did right there. So it's just that, but minus that. So minus one over square root one minus x squared. So that saved quite a bit of time right there. So that's the derivative of cos inverse. We'll put that in a box. So this one's going to be negative 1 over square root 1 minus x squared. So I told you every derivative we compute, you get a free antiderivative. So let's write down the free antiderivative that you get for these right here. So what does the antiderivative look like? <coughs> the way the antiderivative works, you basically, the right, the integral of the right side is the left side. The way we wrote these down, the derivative of the left side is the right side. So maybe it's worth talking about this for a minute. Think of the derivative as a function. Technically, it's a functor because it eats a function and gives you a function. But you can just think of it as a function, if that makes it better. So I'm just going to use d over dx, and I'm just going to call it f. put a capital G on the left side. So if the derivative of big G is little g, how do I move, and if I write the derivative as the function f, how do I get f, this function f, to the other side? Inverse. So I move f to the other side with the inverse function. So in function notation, this is what we're doing. And now I'm going to write in calculus notation instead. So if the derivative of big G is little g, that's the same thing as what is the inverse operation to derivative? got the word anti in it and derivative. It's the antiderivative. So the opposite or the inverse of a derivative is the antiderivative. And how do we write that? This is not proper calculus notation, although I would know what you mean if you did this. I couldn't give you full credit, uh, but I would know what you meant if you wrote that. Meaning I want to not do the derivative. I want to do the opposite of a derivative. But that's not proper calculus notation. We have an integral sign, and we write integral gx dx like that. That's how we write it in calculus. So it's not OK to just write the inverse of the derivative. You want to write this right here. So that's how we take a derivative, uh, an equation written with a derivative in it, and turn it into an equation written with a antiderivative. Now to be fair, or to be complete here, there's also a plus c that's going to come out of this. So we're really going to need to write big g of x plus some constant. And it's going to be the antiderivative. OK, so that's the process we're doing. Now let's go ahead and apply that process to 
the specific derivative that we had here. So the reason I showed you all that, what I'm going to do is move the derivative to the other side as an antiderivative. So that's how I want you to think about turning a derivative to an antiderivative. So we move it over. We're also going to switch the letter to u. So we're going to get sine inverse u plus c equals antiderivative 1 over square root 1 minus u squared du. So there's our antiderivative and what it looks like. So we moved our derivative to the other side, and it shows up not as the inverse derivative, but it shows up as the antiderivative. So there's our sine inverse antiderivative. We get a similar one for cos inverse. It's actually so similar, it's basically off by a little negative sign. Because the derivative was pretty much exactly the same as the derivative of sine inverse. So we're going to play the same game down here. We get cos inverse u plus c equals antiderivative of negative 1 over square root 1 minus u squared du. I don't like that negative sign, so I'm going to move the negative sign by multiplying by negative 1. So we're going to get that negative sign out of there. Technically, that would be a minus c. Before I put a box around this, the entire reason we're doing these is so that you, when you see this form right here, you know what the antiderivative is. So I'm giving you more forms that you see inside of integral, you'll know what the antiderivative actually is. Does this give us a new form down here? If you see 1 over 1 minus u squared, uh, 1 over square root 1 minus u squared, what you should do, just go with this one right here. You have two choices, but I'm going to tell you to just go with the sine inverse choice. So what I'm not going to do is put the second one inside of a box. So I'm going to leave it just the way it is. So I don't recommend you put it on your cheat sheet. It's not going to give you any, um, anything additional or useful overall. And all I'm talking about is the antiderivative. The derivative you still want on your cheat sheet since out of a box, but this antiderivative is not going to give you anything extra useful.